Dark Deeds and Unhealthy Choices, and we're pleased to welcome our two speakers. Peter Gagan, Irish writer, broadcaster, and investigations editor at the award-winning website Open Democracy. His most recent book, Democracy for Sale, Dark Money and Dark Poli Dirty Politics, has been very well received and is currently Book of the Week in this week's Observer. Dr. Philippa Whitford, like Peter, born in Ireland and living in Scotland, is a member of Parliament for Central Ayrshire and sat on the Health Select Committee. She is the shadow SNP Westminster Group Leader Health and this year became SNP Spokesman on Europe. Each will speak for 15 minutes and then we'll open the meeting up for a Q&A session. The theme of tonight's discussion will be the darkening political situation in the UK with a government which plays fast and loose with the truth and sees nothing wrong with breaking its international obligations, while a combination of Brexit, the coronavirus threatens the future of British industry, the economy and our NHS. Before handing over to the speakers, a few housekeeping notes. Firstly, the event is being recorded and we hope to have the video available by the end of the week so check our Facebook page just for updates. Several questions have already been submitted, but please use the chat function to put your questions to our panel. If you could use hashtag question and hashtag named speaker, if that is particularly relevant, to ensure your questions are picked up easily. Turning now to our speakers, I will ask Peter to speak first. Before falling down the rabbit hole of dark money and dirty politics in Britain, Peter tells me he, has le he learned to wrestle in Mongolia for a BBC Radio 4 documentary and has reported from a wide range of countries, including Albania, Kosovo, Bosnia, China, Argentina. The list is seemingly endless. He's written extensively on Northern Ireland and the independence debate in Scotland and elsewhere in Europe. He is also co-founder and current chair of Scottish investigative website, The Ferret. Well <laughs> worth having a look. Peter led Open Democracy's investigations into dark money in British politics, and his insight into these dark machinations is sure to be of value to us all tonight. Peter, if you'd like to come in. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And I guess I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes. I'm going to kind of talk about some of the issues that my book raised uh, and kind of some of the, the background and maybe I'll try and make it a bit current as much as I can as well. But I'm going to start back in the past. And as Joe mentioned, I have, uh, you know, I've, I've done a lot of reporting over the years and this book and this project, these last few years where I spent looking at the role of money and power and lobbying in British politics kind of happened almost by accident. I kind of fell into it doing one of those things I often do, which is reporting. And uh, I, it kind of came about two days before the Brexit referendum and I was in Sunderland, I was working for the Irish Times at the time, I was freelancing for them, uh, working on their reporting around the Brexit referendum. And I was up in Sunderland doing that thing that journalists do, I was going to try and take the temperature ahead of the referendum to see how people were feeling. And I must say it was quite a gloomy uh, 48 hours I spent in Sunderland, I went out to the Nissan factory, I met people who worked in Nissan who were going to vote leave. I met a lot of people who were very, very unhappy, and you could kind of get a sense that there was definitely a very big pro-Brexit presence there. But what kind of tipped me over onto looking at all these issues wasn't any of that. It was actually looking at, uh, it was actually when I was going to leave um, uh, Sunderland, I went, to, I was at the local train station and I saw a copy of the Metro, the free, free sheet newspaper, and had a big advert on the front page and it said, take back control, which I'm sure all of you remember as the vote leave slogan. But interestingly, this big, expensive looking ad on the back of it, I flipped it around, it had the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party's logo, the little line head. And I used to work in Belfast as a reporter, so I thought, this is quite curious. Why is the DUP not a party known for splashing the cash at election time? Why is it buying an advert in Sunderland, hundreds and hundreds of miles away from Belfast? And that's curious. And then um, I kind of did a thing. Another thing reporters do, I, I took a picture of it, sent a tweet and uh, stuffed in my bag because I had to go and find my copy. I got on the train and started writing my story for the next day's newspaper. But in the week, days and kind of weeks that kind of followed, especially because I'm sure you all remember, Sunderland was the first place to declare, or the first major place to declare in the referendum. It was a big leave vote. And it got me thinking about that advert I'd seen. And I remember, because I used to work in Belfast, that Northern Irish political donations are kept secret. And I thought, well, maybe that's interesting. I wonder if that had something to do with the advert I saw. And I kind of thought about it, but I didn't really do anything too much with it, really. But then at the start of 2017, in early 2017, Adam Ramsey, 
at Open Democracy gave me a call and they said, I hear you're interested in the DUP's Brexit referendum campaigning. And I said, because I am too, because he had been in Edinburgh before the referendum and he noticed lots of uh, vote leave placards with a little imprint on the bottom that said paid for by the DUP. So just the same thing I'd seen, but he'd seen these placards whereas I'd seen the newspaper. So two of us started chatting, we decided to do something together on this. So we started working together and kind of looking at it. We were able to see things like, you know, Facebook ads that the DUP had, uh, sp had spent money on, ironically talking about defending our borders, given what's happened with the Irish border over the last four years. Um, and also, you know, we were able to figure out that this advert had been on in the metro all over the United, Great Britain, not the United Kingdom, so it doesn't circulate in, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, and they'd spent money all over the place. So we were able to kind of put together this story that, that initially was able to say the DUP had spent at least a quarter million pounds on the Brexit referendum, which is a huge sum of money, but actually it turned out it was £435,000. This money was rooted through an organisation called the Constitutional Research Council, which sounds very grand. It sounds like a you know, a, a proper research body, and I'll be talking about research institutes and bodies short, in, a little, in a little bit, and how names can be very deceptive when it comes to, to these kind of things. So the Constitution Research Council sounds really grand. Actually, it's what's called an unincorporated association of British electoral law, which is a short way of saying really it's a bit of a legal fiction. It, it doesn't have any company state, it doesn't have legal status. It doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have to file company accounts, doesn't have to list its members, doesn't say where it gets its money from. But unincorporated associations are often vehicles for funding British political campaigns. So what had happened was the DUP had got £435,000 from this Constitution Research Council, which, as we say, it wasn't actually some August research institute in central London or somewhere like that. It was actually a pebble dash semi-detached house on the south side of Glasgow, run by a man called Richard Cook, who's a serial kind of failed Scottish Conservative election candidate. He was the nominal head of this thing called the Constitution Research Council, and they had given the DUP £435,000. But there's two problems with that. One is we don't know where that £435,000 actually came from because Mr. Cook never said it was his money. He always said it was somebody else's, but he didn't have to tell us who it is. And secondly, as myself and Adam Ramsey started writing about uh, the Constitution Research Council, we realised that Mr. Cook had a lot of questionable business uh, background, including having gone into business with the former head of Saudi secret intelligence and a man who'd been involved, a Danish man who'd been involved in gun running in India and various other things. And obviously Mr. Cook denies any wrongdoing in any of these things, but... Nevertheless, it did beg the question, what was somebody who had this sort of background doing funneling almost half a million pounds to the DUP and where did that money actually come from? So that was the kind of start. This is almost, well, yeah, almost four years ago now. I wrote these series of stories about Adam Ramsey at Open Democracy and having been an investigative reporter for a few years, having worked for Channel 4, having done a lot of reporting in Scotland and around the world as well, I started finding myself asking a question I'd never really done before, which was, who spends money in British politics and, and what do they get for them? How does this whole, you know, how does money seep into the political uh, arena? And so having started off looking at the DUP, I started looking at the Brexit referendum more generally. And it was really interesting, I felt, because a lot of my colleagues are former, or former colleagues, you know, people I've worked with, people I know well who are journalists, were saying to me, like, why are you interested in the Brexit referendum and who spent money during it? Because it's over. The referendum was, you know, it was over a year ago, why, why do you care about it? Which I thought was quite revealing in many ways as well about like a kind of mentality about, you know, kind of, I guess in journalism, I've worked in daily journalism, you do have a grind, you're trying to get on to the next story, whatever. But I started looking as with a couple of my colleagues Open Democracy into what had happened during the Brexit referendum in general. So we started looking at things like Vote Leave, the Vote Leave campaign. We were able to find that like remarkably the Electoral Commission, uh, I'm sure some of the people on this call remember the Vote Leave campaign was an, eventually find the maximum amount of money in British electoral law, £20,000, the princely sum, having spent over £7 million, £7 million in a referendum and overspent by over half a million pounds, they were to find £20,000. But I'd like to say, feel like I had some, we had some role in that story because what had happened was the Electoral Commission had reopened their investigation after Joe Mom and others had threatened to judicially review the Electoral Commission's decision not to investigate vote leave. And that followed emails that we got at Open Democracy from an inside the Electoral Commission, where the, inside, the Electoral Commission is saying internally, these, this, all these donations are really strange. This makes no sense. This Darren Grimes fella, all this money from, from vote leave, this makes no sense, but we're not going to investigate it, which was quite remarkable. I thought it was really revealing of what was going on inside the bodies that are supposed to be in charge of and have oversight for British democracy. So that got me starting to kind of think, well, what's going on here? Like, who's in charge of British democracy and what's going on? 
And then I started, we did a lot of research, uh, did a lot of work looking at Aaron Banks, another man I'm sure many of the people on this call might remember. Brexit referendums, biggest donor, the man who gave about more than eight million pounds to leave.eu. And I started looking into his business. And what was so interesting about Aaron Banks is this is the guy who kind of came out of nowhere. He was a minor, minor, minor Tory donor in the 80s, a failed Tory can council candidate. He pops up offering a million pounds to UKIP around before, in the run up to the 20, well, 2015 general election, really. And next thing you know, he's bankrolling this huge campaign in British politics. And again, what I thought was really interesting was a lot of people, journalists, you know, they wrote about him. They wrote really glowingly about him. I think a lot of people kind of bought into his hype. He's kind of got a bit of a spiv character. You know, he he's claimed to have been worth 250 million. So the Sunday Times reports he was worth 250 million. Next thing you know, everyone's saying he's worth 250 million. We spent a lot of time, myself and others, like burrowing into his finances. And I can tell you he's not worth 250 million. He's worth nowhere near 250 million. But not only that, we started looking at, well, what was going on inside these campaigns? Because there's lots of laws around British politics. It's too many. It's really complicated and they don't work. It was one of the things I started to figure out when I was doing all this research. But we started looking at, well, what was going on and how does, how does the campaign, how is his campaign being run? And what was really interesting about Aaron Banks was that he had this insurance business in Bristol, which he said had nothing to do with his political campaign. These things were totally separate. You know, these, this was, these, he had one political campaign and, and his insurance business. And why that matters because actually in British electoral law, you're supposed to declare if you've got a campaign working for you and you're not saying who it is. But anyway, I, myself, my colleagues um, started, well, you know, I started like really looking into this. I started talking to people who'd worked for Aaron Banks' campaign. I spent a lot of time in Bristol trying to figure out well, what was going on with Aaron Banks' campaign. And actually we were able to find out that a lot of things Aaron Banks had said about Leave that you just weren't true. You know, his campaign had worked, his campaign and his political campaign, his business interests were really, really interlinked. The same people were running all of these things. You know, people who he said were actually working for insurance business were working in the political campaign and vice versa. He was selling insurance to his Leave.eu supporters and uh, using insurance data to, uh, to sell Brexit to insurance customers, which is, again, completely against it all. But all he ended up getting was a bit of a wrap across the knuckles because, and that's the thing I found time and again when I've been doing this research, is that if you were willing to break the law, if you're willing to break electoral law or push the boundaries, you will get away with it. There's almost no sanction. There's very few rules in British politics that are actually upheld. You know, if you look at America, Michael Cohn got a, many, a number of years in prison. Michael Cohn famously, Donald Trump's fixer for breaking electoral law. Here in Britain, £20,000 is the maximum fine. And it's not really going to do your political career any harm, as Dominic Cummings shows. You know, Dominic Cummings, the head of the Leave campaign of Vote Leave, he refused a number of times to give evidence to um, the Department for Culture, Media and Sports, Select Committee's inquiry into fake news. And it did him no, you know, he just didn't bother. And he's still, he, you know, he's the most famous and the most important man in British politics now. So we... That's the big takeaway from when it comes to when it comes to our electoral law and from the work I was doing. So moving on a little bit, like what happened then was I started going, okay, well, I've looked at all this Brexit referendum. I've looked at all, like I've looked at the Brexit referendum. I found all these instances of things that like are awry, you know, instances of overspending, instances that things that were never investigated. Like for example, almost all the Brexit campaigns on the leave, vote leave side, to so vote leave, another group called Veterans for Britain, the Democratic Unionist Party. They all spent huge amounts of money on online advertisements with the same company, which you might go, okay, that's reasonable. Maybe it's the only company that's good at it. This one company, there was a company called Aggregate IQ, which was a tiny company, which had seven followers on Twitter and had one office. And the office was above an optician's in a shopping center in a reasonably small Canadian town of Victoria in British Columbia. So just by chance, all these supposedly separate campaigns went and spent huge amounts of money, which this one, uh, targeted advertising campaign. And what they did then was spend a lot of money on Facebook adverts that were targeted at voters in those kind of crucial days running up to the Brexit referendum. And I mentioned this at the start of my book when I was in Sunderland as well. What was really interesting was a lot of people I talked to mentioned Turkey. They were talking about Turkey a lot. And I was really interested. I was like, why are you all talking about Turkey? Because Turkey wasn't that big of a, of a, of a kind of campaign plank officially for vote leave. They didn't talk about it that much. But a lot of them said Facebook. And we now know subsequently that Facebook, uh, Vote Leave ran millions, basically, of ads, well, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of ads about uh, Turkey and warning about Turkey joining the European Union 
on uh, on Facebook. And I, I, when I was doing, when I was writing this book, I interviewed some people who used to work for Vote Leave, and one person said that it was all. It, they, one of the senior Vote Leave staff said, "You know, every week is Turkey Week," and he even brought in like little turkey hats that they all had to wear to, rem- to remind them to keep pushing this message, this kind of hardline message. And to be honest, this nonsense message: that Turkey was about to join the European Union. Nobody, that wasn't going to happen. But it was the way in which you could get political messages out there. And so having done all that, I started like kind of pulling the lens out really much further. And I started lastly asking myself much more questions about, well, how do influence campaigns more generally work in Britain? Like, you know, the Brexit referendum, what was going on the run up to Brexit referendum? How did Brexit come out, you know, of, of British politics? And what was happening after the vote? Because I, I did a lot of, I do a lot of reporting on what's happening day to day. Like I spent the last six months looking at the whole COVID contracting issue. You know, I broke a lot of stories about that. Things like people like Public First, former Vote Leave staffers getting huge contracts on the Public Purse. So I started going, well, how does all these things work? And one area I became very interested in was um, the whole issue of the European Research Group and right-wing think tanks around Brexit. So, you know, how did the European Research Group, this kind of non-entity talking shop in on the back benches of British politics, become a really, really important force that, you know, I would argue has played a huge role in where we are now. It got rid of Theresa May and, and kind of forced this really hardline Brexit. And what I was surprised was when I started writing the book, I decided to interview people who've been in the European Research Group before, and I noticed that no one had really done that. And what was it? What was interesting, because the European Research Group had a long history. It had actually been set up by Dan Hannan back in the early 90s, but it had what we would see now as, you know, not brexit Tory MPs. People like John Burko, David Gawk, uh, Gotto Bebb had all been members of the European Research Group before the Brexit referendum. And I started to talk to them to try and get a sense of how the whole thing had operated. And what was so interesting was basically what you had was a kind of um, an anti-federalist group of Tories, about 10 or 15 of them, met every few months, had a chat, nothing really happened. Then the Brexit referendum happened. Most of the group obviously support did support leave. There wasn't that many of them. But then almost a day after the Brexit vote, Steve Baker and a couple of other people who were really kind of clued in, realized that they had this already existing vehicle within the Conservative Party that could be could be kind of you know taken as, as an opportunity as a kind of a shell, just like happens in American politics. And that was how the European Research Group became this really, really important uh, kind of vehicle because they were able to kind of push into this already existing thing that exists on the back bench of British politics, but also was funded by the taxpayer because it's public money that supports the European Research Group's so-called research. And at Open Democracy, we had to go all the way to the courts to get uh, IPSA, the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority, to give us their research, the European Research Group, even research, even though it's paid for by public money. So we found their research, and you'd be really surprised to find out that it wasn't very good. We showed us lots of experts who didn't think it was very good. But what's interesting about the European Research Group is it's a part of what I call the Americanization of British politics. And it's this kind of rise of what I call dark money, of secretive donations into British politics, whether that's from the Democratic Unionist Party or, or into the Democratic Unionist Party or unincorporated associations in the Conservative Party, the rise of big money in British politics. We've never seen as much money going into British politics. You know, the Conservatives raised more than £40 million pounds ahead of the last general election. But also what you see in Britain, I think, is that because our political donations, they look a lot less in America. It's way less actual money. So when I started doing this work, I thought, well, it doesn't make that much of a difference, does it? Because it's not like America. You don't need tens of millions of pounds, hundreds of millions of pounds to influence politics. But actually in Britain, it's almost more susceptible because parties depend on private money and you less money, you don't need that much money to buy influence. We saw it during the, a couple of months ago at Richard Desmond. Richard Desmond goes to a Conservative Party fundraiser, pays 12 grand for a table, and he gets to sit next to Robert Jenrick, the housing minister, who then, by his own admission, shows bias in his planning application, saving Mr. De- Desmond £50 million on, uh, on his, his property development in East London. That's not bad return for your money, 12 grand, 50 million, you know. It's, it's, there's, there's, it clearly there's money to be made there, but it's not just someone like Richard Desmond. For £50,000 a year, you can become a, mem- a, a part of what's called a Conservative Leaders Group. And that'll get you a quarterly meeting with the Conservative Prime Minister and leading cabinet ministers. And that's all off the record and that's all secretive. But that's not the only aspect, I think, of the Americanization of British politics that we've seen as well. I, I, lo- I talk a lot in my book and I spend a lot of time looking at the rise of these think tanks, of libertarian think tanks, the Institute of Economic Affairs, Centre for Policy, Policy Exchange, all these groups which have got names that sound very legitimate, 
sound very, you know, sound like they're all doing kind of independent research, but they're actually funded by corporate donors. And going back to the 70s, these people have had a real impact on British politics. They've pushed British politics in, in directions that I think you could argue were not like popular decisions. But particularly around Brexit, a lot of these groups, having been kind of agnostic enough about Brexit, some of them, some of them very pro-Brexit, in line with, with people in Washington, the run-up to the referendum, after the Brexit vote, they all became incredibly pro-Brexit. And what they did was they offered an opportunity for, uh, for groups to really kind of, for, for kind of, uh, for others to get behind a kind of, a kind of almost like an, uh, they offered a kind of opportunity for uh, people to say there was an alternative plan. It's a kind of the IEA's version of Brexit. And if you think these groups don't matter now, if you remember recently, uh, Matt Hancock made his announcement that he was going to um, get rid of, abolish Public Health England and replace it with this new organisation headed by Tory peer Dido Harding, whose husband is a Tory MP. That announcement was made at Policy Exchange, which is a think tank funded by anonymous corporate donors. And it was a policy decision that all these think tanks have been pushing since the very start of the pandemic, that the problem was Public Health England and everything would be fine if we just got rid of Public Health England. So we're seeing time and again, whether it's the Brexit process and where we are now with it, or it's with British politics more generally and policy decisions, whether it's from free ports to the idea of a US-UK free trade deal that will solve all of Britain's problems. Really these groups, which don't have huge amounts of money, the Institute for Economic Affairs in 2015 had a turnover of about two million pounds. And it estimated in its own uh, kind of estimation that it had 66 million pounds worth of media coverage. What these groups are really good at doing is getting into media and getting traction with conservative backbench MPs and the likes of the European Research Group and putting that front and center of British politics. And to me, as an outsider, or someone who's not from Britain originally, it's been fascinating to see just how much small amounts of money and really well kind of um, well-focused lobbying has shifted the political dynamics of Britain so much. So thank, thank you very much, Peter. That was really interesting. I think we could all say it's been a very long four years for all of us, uh, but your investigations have certainly been vital to ensure that all of these attacks on our democracy are being highlighted and challenged. So thank you very much for all your hard work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now um, I'll turn to Dr. Philippa Whitford. And um, before her election to Westminster in May 2015, Philippa focused much of her clinical career in the field of breast cancer. She was a consultant breast surgeon for over 19 years in Ayrshire and Arran and was lead clinician for that health board and lead clinician of the West of Scotland MCN from 2006 to 2009. She was also involved in the first sign guidelines for breast cancer. An impressive resume for a woman who was told halfway through medical school that she couldn't be a surgeon as she was a woman. In addition to her parliamentary roles noted before, she is currently on the Committee on the Future Relationship with Europe, which is chaired by Hilary Benn, and she's committed to the European cause. Her husband, being a doctor from Germany, also helped. We are looking forward now to hearing her views on the worrying activities in Parliament and the situation we're faced generally. Thank you, Philippa, if you'd like to speak. Uh, thank you very much, Jill. Um, I'm going to talk uh, very much about uh, what I've been talking about for the last over four years, which is the impact of Brexit on health. It's kind of what I spoke about in 2016 in the campaign, but I wasn't very well known, so I wasn't on telly. I was just doing little bits on the internet and on Facebook, and clearly nobody was listening to me. My speeches at the time were able to be positive. Please be aware of all these great health benefits that we get from Europe. Don't throw them away. Unfortunately, my speeches now tend to be kind of a bit more depressing, so I warn you, get your hanky out. And that's simply because the EU is about much more than trade. It is about social protection. It's about reinforcing the things that are important to us. And it has been about setting rules that make sure that individuals can't be exploited. And obviously that's very much, that level playing field is very much what the battle between the UK and the EU is about at the moment. 
So just thinking about the big impacts on health from Brexit. So I'm going to take you through kind of about five big impacts that you will notice in your life if you are someone who uses the NHS, which let's face it, is most of us. So number one is workforce. Uh, regardless of the impression politicians often give, patients are treated by people, not machines. The people might use a machine, they might work in a building, but it is actually a person who is caring for you, a person who listens to your symptoms and who diagnoses you. And here we are, we are four years on, and there are still EU citizens who are struggling to get settled status, to get full settled status, or their families are struggling. So what we've seen is we've seen a certain percentage of doctors and nurses leaving the UK, but we've seen a 90% drop, 90% drop in EU nurses coming to the UK. Now at a time when England has 43,000 nursing vacancies, that is something that is absolutely dire. The next one is about medicines and medical devices. Basically, there's about 41 million packets of drugs go from the UK to Europe every month, and about 37 million that come the other way. The problem is they're different drugs. The UK doesn't produce insulin. We import all of it. We don't produce radioisotopes that we use in things like cancer scanning and a certain amount of cancer screening. And the problem, particularly with radioisotopes, you may remember all the talk about stockpiling and so on in 2019, is you can't stockpile radioisotopes. The radioactivity literally disappears in a matter of days. Now, the European Medicines Agency, which used to be based in London, has now shifted to Amsterdam. And because it was based in London, it actually attracted other pharmaceutical firms from elsewhere in, in, elsewhere in the world to base themselves there as well. So it attracted some very high power jobs. But the issue isn't the European Medicines Agency leaving the UK. It's the fact that the UK is leaving the European Medicines Agency because it's a single drug licensing system for the whole of the EU. And that means that a new drug gets from the laboratory bench to patients in a much shorter time than it would have been the case in the past. New drugs are launched in Europe at much the same time as America because it's a market of about 500 million people. The problem is the UK is no longer part of that market. And like Canada and Australia, they have to wait an extra six months to a year before new drugs tend to be launched in their market. One of the other things the European Medicines Agency has done is it has pushed research by funding it in rare diseases and particularly in children. So we've made more progress in things like cystic fibrosis and muscular dystrophy in the last decade or so than in all the years before. And we're going to be on the outside of that. Reciprocal healthcare. I hope any of you who travel at all to Europe have got that little plastic EHIC card in your wallet. Now that's something that means that if you're visiting Oktoberfest in Munich and you have a wee shandy too many fall over and break your ankle, you'll be treated as if you were a German citizen. And I think that's something fantastic, especially as I fell over here last year and smashed my ankle quite badly. I wouldn't like to be facing that in another country and trying to work out what my insurance covered and what it didn't. Now, some people say, oh, but we, we take travel insurance anyway. Your travel insurance to Europe is so cheap because it's underpinned by the European health insurance system. Now, for pensioners who want to retire to the south of Europe, they use a thing called an S1 form because they didn't pay tax in France or Spain, but they shift their health and social care rights from all the tax they've paid here to the country they want to settle in. That's coming to an end. And you know, it's not just been rich pensioners who've been able to do that with freedom of movement, ordinary pensioners who've saved a little bit have been able to make that choice to settle in sunnier climes for the last years of their lives. That is not going to be affordable for most of them because they would have to have full private health insurance. And the other part of the system is for plan treatment. At the moment, even someone with kidney failure 
who needs dialysis three times a week can travel to Europe and book those sessions under the European health insurance system. That isn't a matter of insurance because it's not that it might happen, it's going to definitely happen. So how on earth is an ordinary person going to travel in Europe who needs dialysis? These people simply won't be able to travel at all. The fourth one is research. The EU is actually the largest research network in the world. It's bigger than America, it's bigger than China. And now they have a new clinical trial system that is streamlining the ability of countries to work together because the best quality research is always international and we're on the outside of it. And a critical thing in research is the ability to share data. Indeed, in our modern world, being able to share data is critical for almost anything happening. And yet even a data agreement isn't there as yet. There is a research funding system called Horizon 2020. And actually the UK was the biggest beneficiary before 2016. We have now slid down the rankings and we are about fifth because we used to get more out than we put in because the UK is recognized as a really good center for research. We have a high proportion of universities. And for me as a Scottish MP, Scotland has 50% higher ratio of universities per head of population than England does. So we used to also punch well above our weight in attracting research grants. And at the moment with literally three months to go, universities haven't the first clue what is going to replace that. And the last one, and this one sounds kind of quite trivial and straightforward, but as we've seen from the UK internal market bill this week, this one actually has tentacles that spread everywhere. And that is public health and things like standards, safety standards, work standards. You know, cleaning up our water, our sewage, improving our beaches, tackling air pollution, acid rain. Many of these improvements were driven by EU standards. And some of them like around air pollution were fought tooth and nail by the UK government. And the other one is health and safety of workers. You hear it all the time, health and safety gone mad. People mock the idea of health and safety. And the Tories particularly are very anti-red tape. Well, I can tell you, having actually been a surgeon, dealing with things like thermal burns, chemical burns, arm injuries from machinery, one man's red tape is another man's life and limb. And these standards and these regulations have been protecting us for the last 40 odd years. And the mere fact that this government won't commit to any of them tells us all we need to know about what's going to happen next. Now, obviously, one of the ones that's had quite a lot of coverage recently is things like food standards, food safety, food labeling. The UK government refused to guarantee protecting the standards of our food. It was even one of their own backbenchers, who's the chair of the Environment and Rural Affairs Committee, who laid an amendment to actually say that UK food standards would not fall below what they are now and what they are in the EU. The government forced their MPs to vote against it. Now, this brings us, of course, to the dreaded chlorine chicken. It's not an issue of it being washed in chlorine. You know, if you go swimming in a swimming pool, you'll have swallowed more chlorine than you're going to get off that chicken. The issue is why it's washed in chlorine. And that's because the US have got between seven and 10 times the rate of salmonella food poisoning than we have in the UK. And as I commented in my speech last week, you know, this kind of thing might drive people to become vegetarian, except that in America, they're allowed much higher pesticide residues than here. And if you think that you're going to be really careful and actually look at how you choose what you buy, you're probably not going to know because the UK internal market bill challenges labeling. And I think that these things will simply be hidden and you won't have the right to know what's in the food you're eating, how it was grown, how it's been handled. So why would we do that? Why would we want to lose the protection 
that it's clear most people actually value. And it's quite simple. It's all about trade deals, particularly a trade deal with the US. But we also know that the UK is planning to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, like TTIP, and you'll remember that back in about 2014, there was lots of discussion about the Transatlantic Investment Partnership trade deal and a thing that was hidden inside it, which was the investor state dispute settlement. This is a tribunal system largely run by business people. It's not a court that allows a business to challenge a government for any decision that might reduce their profits. Now, there's no system in it that would allow a government to tackle a company for the extra costs of say, causing lots of lung cancer or strokes or dementia by selling cigarettes. But Philip Morris was able to challenge Australia over plain cigarette packaging. And even if a government will win the case in the end, the cost, the time and the pressure of that creates a fear within governments that they will be challenged and taken to an investor state dispute tribunal. So that undermines public health measures that are for the benefit of all of us. And very much the internal market bill that went through last week, which is a power grab from devolved governments after 20 years of Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland having their own parliaments. The question is why? Why would they dismantle devolution at this point in time? And it's simply to be able to offer the whole UK market to the US or access to the whole UK market through the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Because often the devolved governments actually have higher regulations. Things like public health in Scotland that was the first to launch the smoking ban. We wouldn't be able to do that now after the UK internal market bill. In its white paper on the bill, the government even challenged the minimum unit pricing of alcohol policy that we have here in Scotland. And although bills or acts that are already in existence are exempt, it could be, it's not clear, but it could be that if the Scottish government wanted to make the unit price higher, even that amendment would suddenly bring it under this bill and they would lose the power to do so. On the environment, Wales was the first to introduce a carrier bag charge. Scotland was the first last year to ban plastic cotton buds. We don't allow GM crops. We don't allow fracking. That is not what the UK government want. They don't want diversity. The internal market of the UK, if such a thing exists, has coped with variation for decades and decades. But suddenly now, Everything has to be under the control of Westminster. And all of that is about selling it out to Donald Trump. Now, one of the other things that the bill includes, which is very frightening for us in Scotland, is power over public procurement, which is a completely devolved competency. There is no marketization in NHS Scotland. We still have a single unified publicly delivered NHS in Scotland. In NHS England, under Section 75 of the Health and Social Care Act, the thing that has torn your uh, NHS apart, all possible contracts have to be put out to tender. And there were six commissioning groups in Surrey a few years ago who realised that Virgin weren't doing too well on the kind of community health services side, and they wanted to just bring it back under NHS control. They weren't breaking the contract. The contract was coming to an end and yet Virgin sued them. And while the figures are secret, it's estimated that it was over two million pounds that those commissioning groups had to pay to Virgin to settle out of court. That's two million pounds that was not spent on drugs or hip replacements. And we're seeing the same outsourcing drive during COVID. Millions of pounds of PPE contracts have been given to crazy companies pest extermination company, a sweetie maker, companies with no experience of PPE and very little money registered at company's house being given contracts for over a hundred million. Test and trace in England has also been completely outsourced and we all know what a shambles that is. The testing was set up after being outsourced to Deloitte, to the commercial lighthouse labs. 
and CERCO is running the call centres for contact tracing. Now in Scotland, we are still stuck with the testing. We have a lighthouse lab in Glasgow, whereas if they had funded NHS labs to expand, we would have got a small share of that money, which we could have invested in our NHS labs. However, our contact tracing is under our own control and is run by traditional NHS public health teams, not commercial systems. They're reaching 98% of COVID cases and 97% of their contacts. CERCO are barely reaching 60% of contacts. That means 40% of people who've been in contact with someone who has COVID, who's proven to have COVID, have no idea. So they are wandering around, not isolating, because simply no one has been in touch to tell them. Now, one of the other things that's threatened to our NHS because of an American trade deal, is you may remember that Trump was talking about things like drug prices. He blames the NHS for drugs being so expensive in America. And one of their demands is full market access with no central procurement. Now, it won't mention drugs in any trade deal. It won't mention the NHS, but it talks about full market access with, and therefore no central procurement, no price agreements or fixing. And it was estimated by Panorama that drug costs in the NHS across the UK would double or triple. Again, the NHS simply can't afford this. Now in Scotland, we have central procurement of drugs, of machines, of PPE. We have our own stockpile and we never ran out during COVID. We also have had our own parliament for the last 20 years. And actually it's something that's quite important to people in Scotland. We've been able to make different decisions to protect ourselves from some decisions taken at Westminster, but also to look at our greater deprivation, to look at our aging population. We provide free childcare, free university tuition, free prescriptions and free personal care to our elderly. Not all the people in Scotland support independence. I'm not going to claim anything like that, but the vast majority of people support devolution. So if Boris Johnson thinks that his internal market bill that he's pushing through at the moment will rebuild a happy United Kingdom, he's very much mistaken. It's basically like thinking that refusing a divorce, locking up your wife and taking away her checkbook is a good way to save a marriage. So we're not going anywhere. We're not laying charges across the Solway fault and we'll still be neighbors. But I have to warn you, independence in Scotland is coming. So we might as well accept it and do it in a friendly manner rather than being vicious to each other. Thank you. Well, thank you, Philippa. Um, you were so right that the full impact of Brexit on health issues here in the UK is going to be something that will affect us all deeply and certainly a great cause for concern. Uh, here in Oxford we've already seen firsthand the effect of so many EU citizens who work in our Oxford hospitals leaving the profession and the country. We're made poorer by that and so sad to see them go. So thank you for your words, very much appreciated. Now I'm going to hand over to Peter and Susan who've been picking up questions and um, from the chat, and we'll direct them at the person, whichever of the speakers is designated. But thank you both very much. Well, thank you indeed. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Peter and Philippa. Formidable, uh, and I think highly memorable. Um, we've got people from all over the country on the meeting, but of course the majority are Oxford. Um, I want to just start with, um, with a question for uh, Peter. And um, it's from Colin Gordon, he says, your book is a whole set of snapshots of the inner history and players of the ongoing Brexit coup stroke takeover stroke corruption. Um, do we now have a working theory of the current UK regime power structure, e.g. how much power does Cummings have? What is it and where did he get it from? Your book is especially strong on the links from Tufton Street to the US. So what about overseas players, including the Americans and the Russians? Over to you, Peter. It's a very interesting question. I think it's a question a lot of political journalists are asking all the time. You know, I'm really struck when I talk to people I know who are political journalists. And a lot of them are unsure. I think 
realist really I think it is what I think you know Johnny Friedland and others christened it as soon as Boris Johnson came into power and appointed Dominic Cummings I think it is a vote leave government I think that's the reason why Dominic Cummings stayed after his lockdown busting trip to Durham I think the one fundamental tenant of the government is that it's 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 the government of vote leave it's really really striking if you look at the appointments within government you know, all the people have come in, all the spads, you know, every almost every spad who's ever appointed has been at vote leave. It seems if you just if you'd wandered into vote leave office in 2016, picked up a pencil and rang a couple of phones, you could now get a really good paying job in Westminster. And it's not just jobs in as spads, it's the same with the COVID contracting, the kind of things I've been doing recently. Whether it's Hanbury strategy, which is Paul Stevenson who's at vote leave, or um, public first, which is Rachel Wolf, who wrote the Tory manifesto in 2019, and James Frain who's got a huge long history of coming, dating back to the 2003 anti-devolution uh, referendum in the northeast of England. The kind of defining feature of this government is vote leave. And it kind of makes sense if you look at how the government operates. The government operates like a campaign. It's a constant campaign. Like policies are kind of floated and then pulled back. It's not about doing things. It's not about achieving things. It's often about fighting quite dividing populations, which is very much a vote leave strategy too. You need to divide the electorate into sections. Thomas Borick, who I mentioned in my book, uh, who's one of these kind of young political consultants, again, actually the son of a, a Tory donor and uh, Lord Borick and his wife, Victoria, who was the former Tory MP for Kensington. Um, you can see a bit of a trend here. Um, he talks about trying to vote, like, kind of segment the electorate. And I can't remember how many, like 50, 60, 70 different groups. And it feels a lot like that's the process that's going on now. Every, I, almost, especially the weekends, almost every weekend, I, I said it on Twitter the other day, Saturday evening has become silly season, okay? Kind of weekly silly season in British journalism, where all sorts of stuff are, all sorts of kites are flown, whether it's Paul Dacre taking over Ofcom and Charles uh, Moore uh, taking, becoming the chairman of the BBC, or the Department for Education banning the use of quote unquote anti capitalist material in schools. And it all seems kind of engineered to try and get people angry and to get like, you know, not of any kind of policy outcome. And really, it's very interesting, rarely these policies actually ever you know, brought into so far, they've often these policies don't actually exist. They're not actually like kind of, they don't happen, but they happen in terms of media uh, and they kind of happen in terms of like kite flying. So I kind of, it does feel like Dominic Cummings is very much the, the kind of def defining feature of it. And, and I guess it's interesting. I think the big question is still why? There's a really interesting psychological question considering the nature of our government. You know, we have a prime minister who does not seem to be particularly in charge of anything. We have a cabinet that is, you know, as some described them as vegetables, which feels like it's been quite kind to, to, uh, to, 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 to are quite unfair on vegetables. And, um, you know, they are powerless and rudderless and, and don't even pretend that they think they have any, you know, Gavin Williamson still has a job. He's still the education minister. That's, that says everything you need to know. Um, and so what you've got at the centre then at the apex is, is Michael Gove and Dominic Cummings, who are two people who've got a really long history. I think Gove's relationship with this is very important. And I think one of the most interesting things that I've noticed in the last few months of covering it has been the increasing amalgamation, not just of number 11, actually, and number 10, which I actually think is, is probably less so than is seen, but actually the cabinet office has become this central thing, a central hub for running the government in a big way. And I think there's a, that's really, really kind of um, quite concerning and in many ways, very, very anti-democratic as well. Um, and so I find all of, I, it does feel like it's, the, yeah, it's the vote leave model of government uh, and the vote leave approach to politics kind of in, in action. Um, the Tufton Street stuff is really fascinating as well, um, in part because, you know, what, um, what I mean by that is these kind of think tanks, these kind of, you know, lobbying outfits, um, kind of corporate lobbyists, the, the likes of the Institute of Economic Affairs, the Policy Exchange, all these people, they really, you know, they, they have a lot of sway in government, it feels like increasingly, like, and that's where I think you can see policies happening. So if you look at Robert Jenrick's um, proposals on land, um, on, on building in Britain, which basically says that what they should do is kind of designate land as development land or non-development land, undevelopment land, you can do whatever you want. That's straight for a policy exchange paper written by a guy called Jack Airy, who's now Boris Johnson's uh, advisor on housing to Boris Johnson. And this is seen across the, um, across the piece. You're seeing this move of people from Tufton Street into uh, Downing Street. And also, in some respects, you're seeing like, you know, these Tufton th Street think tanks just becoming much more vocal and much more uh, their kind of ideas are like the Freeport idea is a straight out of Tufton Street and now it's government policy and most people think it's a very bad idea 
but because we don't have much that you know it just kind of walks straight into the policy agenda so we can see a lot of it. it's quite hard to figure out you know i think it's less a case that there's some huge amount of money for america that's got some great overarching vision that they want to develop i think it's much more kind of cronious capitalism so it's, it's policy it's small po it's policies like free ports it's like it's in single interventions it'll be interesting to see what happens around the uk us free trade deal if we ever get there and um, we might never get there but you will imagine we'll see even more lobbying around it but yeah my big takeaway is that it, it is it's it's the vote leave government thank you very much peter um just while um i have a word the um chat line is still open so please keep the questions coming uh, i think Philip wanted to comment as well on that yeah, just, I mean, I'm, you know, talking about Tufton Street. I keep waiting to see that Kate Andrews has moved from uh, Tufton Street into the Department of Health and Social Care. I mean, my impression is two things, is that a lot of it is about money. Um, I mean, there was a lot of money that backed uh, Boris Johnson's leadership campaign, a lot of hedge fund people, people like Crispin Odie and so on, who are disaster capitalists. They make their money out of chaos and disaster. Um, I don't think that Boris Johnson, we know that he wrote the two articles, one for Remain, one for Leave, because he was not a committed Leaver. Um, and he's bone idle. I think that's one thing that you need to understand. And I think that's why Dominic Cummings has so much influence is Boris Johnson is bone idle. He does not read things. He doesn't look at detail. He doesn't think things through and he has, instead of surrounding himself then, but with a lot of clever people to advise him and work things out, he has surrounded himself in the cabinet with a bunch of yes people who will just do what they're told, no matter how they voted in 2016. And that's what gives Cummings so much of his power. And the movement of power into the cabinet office is that I think Michael Gove still sees that eventually Boris Johnson will fall over his own clown shoes and Gove will look like a good alternative out of the vote leave caravan. Um, and he is just gathering some of the reins into the cabinet office to have as much um, power as possible. And the problem with, with Gove is he's not lazy and he's not stupid um, and he is a committed leaver. So, you know, where where we go, who knows? But um, Boris Johnson just wanted to be prime minister and he wanted his shot after David Cameron. And that's very much what it's been about. And I think he's probably pretty disappointed at how tough a gig it has been uh, all year with COVID. I think he just expected to deliver Brexit, be feted and applauded. And that's what he's doing it for. Right. Thank you. We've had some questions coming through on the chat line, so um, can I hand over to Susan? I forgot to unmute, it's the usual crime. Um, I had a question from Jane Tom, which I think probably both of our speakers will want to comment on, and is why has the media rolled over and lost any desire to investigate, inform and challenge? Peter, perhaps, sir? I don't think I, I'm going to stand up for my media colleagues. I've been a journalist for a long time. I don't think the media has has stopped trying to cover politics, trying to inform and challenge. I think there's much more systemic problems. And I think if it was just a case of having different journalists and different media doing something differently, I would be all for it and think it was great. And I'm not saying there isn't stuff that I would like to see better reported. But I think there's a much more systemic problem. So what you've got is, you know, we're now in 24 seven media. So like, it's really hard So stories run really quickly. There's a huge amount of like back, you know, back when I started as a journalist, mainly it was in print. So you had newspapers and they had to be filled once a day. Now you've got huge amounts of acreage online that you want to fill as well as a newspaper. Plus you've got 24 seven rolling broadcast news. And I think that's a really, that's changed dynamic in a massive way because it means Things happen much more quickly and stories get forgotten about much more quickly and journalists move on and they think the public is moving on. They're constantly, journalists always want to be new with stuff. And I think that's a, I think it's a problem actually. I do think that's a problem. I think it's almost hardwired into journalism, this idea that you kind of are always looking for a new thing and whatever is new is important rather than what's, um, you know, rather than spending time to kind of excavate and try and find out what's actually happening, which is the kind of work I try to do. So I think that's the that's the thing I think that's missing. I think, you know, and I think 
that's the re- that's a real challenge. And what's really hard as well is I think there's been a real politicization of journalism. I think we've seen that. You know, I write my book about Liam Fox. So you know, Liam Fox um, when he was defence secretary at Atlantic Bridge. The long it's a long story, but the, the short version is basically Liam Fox ran this think tank slash charity that was funded by Dark Money from America called Atlantic Bridge. He'd spent the early 2000s cultivating lots of, of American Republicans. Once he got into office, he was made Secretary of Defense, kept up this, this uh, think tank slash charity and had his best mate attending all these meetings with him as Secretary of Defense. And if you think about what happened, if that had happened now in the last couple of years, be prominent Brexiteer, so that would become a very partisan thing. So the Telegraph wouldn't touch it, and the Times probably wouldn't either. And it would become, a, it just, I think it wouldn't be, it would barely be a story now. I think we've got so used to levels of political corruption. Whereas back when that happened in 2010, 2011, all the Fleet Street, all the different newspapers and journalists all sort of running after it. So I think that was a really big part. I think that was really important. And also I think it's really, you can see it with the BBC. The BBC is definitely cowed and under threat at the moment. You know, it's got this new guy in, Tim Davey, who is already talking about how the BBC needs to be more impartial, which I think is like, you know, already kind of making this idea that the BBC is, is biased within it. I think the kind of stuff we're seeing about Paul Dacre going to Ofcom and Charles Moore, I think there's a kind of constellation of things I think are making British journalism really hard to do. And also there's a lot less money in British journalism than there used to be. So it's kind of like a really, really unhelpful, like kind of constellation of forces. I'm not saying that there isn't a huge need to do more of this work. I think there's a kind of sphere amongst some people saying public broadcasting to do more of work. And then at the same time, you've got newspapers like The Telegraph that have just gone down, you know, have just gone down completely been red pills and don't cover any of this stuff. And I think when things aren't being covered, like it's interesting to say with my book, my book was only reviewed in The Guardian, well, The Observer, which is kind of like The Guardian. It was reviewed in all the Scottish papers, all the Irish papers, but nobody else in Fleet Street touched it. I think it's because of this kind of bifurcation of, of, of British journalism. So I think it's a bigger problem, unfortunately, than just the lack of appetite in newsrooms. I mean, I, I would agree with that. And I think that, um, I think some of the fundamental issue is as you said like the telegraph and so on you know even the bbc you know there is a degree of partisanship i mean it's always been allowed in newspapers but they're they're more and more blatant there's there's no attempt to have any kind of discussion and even the broadsheet end of that where you would have expected you know yes we are supporters of conservatism however this is a mess you know a lot of that is disappearing because it's absolutely partisan. And you know, the work that you were doing, Peter, in open democracy, more and more of our challenging media, our investigative journalism, like what you do at the moment with the ferret, is literally self-funding, crowdfunding, you yeah, know, online. Very much, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the problem is, you know, if you're going to do a Watergate investigation that's going to take you months to try to unpick something you know how does how does tufton street connect to the elliots how much money have they given to matt hancock etc you know it's very hard to do that if actually you're not putting in any copy you're not getting any funding and you need to put food on the table so actually a lot of it is um is about the structure of the british media now that you know with harry evans dying recently you know the idea of a of, of an unimpeachable, you know, high quality newspapers is, is just something that we've lost. And we've lost it over, over decades. Rupert Murdoch obviously bought up a lot of papers. And in Scotland, he bought R.S. McCall's, the news agents that my mum used to work in the head office. He would not allow certain magazines and newspapers to be sold. So you had someone who owned satellite TV, newspapers, and the distribution of newspapers. How on earth did we ever allow something like that to happen? So when people, I see in the chat quite a lot, people are saying, what can we do? One of the things is that these, these little groups that are going, you know, you've read our article, Byline Times, Open Democracy, whatever it is, can you spare a little bit of money to support us? Do that, because without that, there won't be any voice at all that is digging down and revealing some of these scandals. 
I would second that. Thank you, Philip. No, I do agree as well. Because like, it's, it's true too. Though. Like, I work Send me the you. check in the post, Peter. Yeah, I check by post <laughs> orders, you know, any, you know, bank, bank transfers, all accepted. But no, it's true. I think there's, it's a huge, huge problem. And it's, it's part of the reason uh, why I end up working, you know, having worked in what we might call mainstream media for years, I now work for Open Democracy because I've been able to do the stories I want to pursue but it's a huge challenge financially and but it's the only way at, unfortunately at the moment it's the only way to get the time and the space to do this work and I think it's really important. Thank you. I'll pass over to Lizzie to ask the next question. Um, thank you. Um, thank you both. We, well we've had a couple of questions on that point which you've answered well I think you've answered unless you've got anything more to say which is what can we all do about our anxiety about what's going on um, and the other question, which I think is a very good question too, which just builds on the th same similar sort of things, is that when do you think that, is, is a question from um, Annette Shaw, um, how soon do you think the lies and the cheating will be uncovered when Brexit starts to bite? Do you think it will be uncovered? I think it's a question for you both, but maybe Peter first. I guess it depends on being uncovered. I guess we do, I feel like we have a fairly good idea now of what happened during the Brexit referendum. Like, I, I feel like we have a pretty good, you know, we know lots of laws were broken. We know quite a bit about what went on. I think there's still, there's still a few unanswered questions. I think we have a fairly good uh, idea about it. I guess it, there's, a, there's a bigger problem, which kind of I find with a lot of my work and, and trying, to, like, trying to, 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 uh, to, to make it more, um, uh, to try and like, take it out to other audiences. Like, how do you get people to really care and engage with it. I think that's a really big problem and I think you know we, it isn't helped by the way sometimes it's reported in general like I thought the way you know, there's the opportunity what we saw say with the electoral commission report into vote leave what happened with that was Matthew Elliott had a one-to-one -one interview with Laura Coonsberg on BBC about a week before it came out where he was able to rubbish the electoral commission report before it even came out by the time the report came out it was in response to something that was already, you know, had already been basically briefed against. And I think that was part of the problem. But more generally, I think there's a really big problem about how do you get people to engage with all this stuff and care about, not just with the Brexit referendum, but in politics more generally. Whether in the 2019 general election, whatever it is, I think there's a kind of, that to me is the really big challenge, is how do you get people to care? How do you get people to think, well, this is some, these are issues that we really should be concerned about. I mean, I think what you're doing this evening, hosting this and looking at the chat, people identifying where they're from, it may well be that the majority are from Oxford, but you've got people from all over the place. And, and I think organizing and not shutting up is really important, um, you know, to, to kind of accept this and just go down with the ship and say it's all over, I think would be wrong. There is not a quick return you don't have a general election until 2024 but you need to keep organizing and you need to speak to the younger generation because they are the ones that are most hit by this you know everything is hitting them most the the, the covid recession will hit them most the loss of freedom of movement will hit them most they see themselves as europeans so in in almost a sense uh, if you like, an embryonic version of rejoin starts now. There's no point in calling it that, but you need to be airing this stuff. You need to be highlighting. And as we go into next year, I mean, I'm on the, the EU committee. It is going to be such a shitstorm. Excuse my French, but January is going to be awful. And, and we mustn't let them you know, hide it. We mustn't let them hide the economic impact of Brexit under COVID. That's one of the reasons why I'm afraid they're going to go for no deal, because they get a bigger political gain from their, you know, absolute pure uh, Brexit purists, whereas a hard deal doesn't make me happy. I'm still moaning, but the Brexiteers are moaning as well. So politically, what they're asking for is such a hard deal the, the, the economic gap between their kind of deal and no deal is, is relatively small. It's about one and a half, two percent GDP. And I think that they will go for the harder one and they will just think they can sweep it under COVID, blame everything on COVID. Oh, we'd have had a brilliant Brexit if only we hadn't had the pandemic. So I think talking to people funding researchers, getting it out there. And one of the things that's very striking in Scotland after our 
referendum is how political people are. The mere fact I'm sitting here talking to you, I never, as a breast cancer surgeon for 33 years, would never have thought I would have ended up in politics. But I know so many women who were part of our campaign in 2014, who are MSPs, who are councillors, or who are standing next year. So a lot of it is that this debate and this discussion can bring people into politics. And I think it's really important to bring young people in. So keep meeting, keep funding, keep talking about it, because to just throw your hands up, that, that's just not acceptable, because otherwise it will get worse and worse and worse. They will keep pushing. Well, thank you very much on a skate, chastening thought. Um, the next question actually came from Dave Winpenny, and he asks, um, in the context of the threatened appointments to Ofcom and, and the BBC, um, which may or may not be kite flying, we don't know, but it's a question, um, is the threat to the independence of BBC and Ofcom real? So maybe Peter would like to take that first. I guess, it, I think it is. I think it's already quite real. You know, I think we've definitely seen, um, you know, I think the appointment of Tim Davy, I think the noise that Tim Davy has been making, like, it's quite clear. If you even just see, like, you know, if you're asking about why journalists aren't doing more of this, like, if you look at the BBC, there's, they've got a really good strand, well, they had a really good current affairs strand um, called um, uh, Inside Out, which was made, it was made a lot of regional versions of it. I knew the one in Bristol because it did some good work in Aaron Banks. That's just been gutted. It's now all been moved, centralised to Birmingham. I think there's like three people in charge of like 150 hours of television or something in ridiculous. Like that. And all the journalists have been either deployed or let go. So all these investigative journalists and regions have just been have been cast adrift. And that's my big problem. Um, that's my really big problem. You know, that's my that's a really big concern. And I think what you what you'll see, what I would worry, I really worry about is that you're going to see less and less of um, in like investigative journalism and insightful journalism. And I think the, the extent to which the conservative narrative and the Brexiteer narrative of the last four years that the BBC is the enemy of the people and journalists in general are the enemies of people, the liberal metropolitan elite and all those other cliched terms. And the extent to which it's now become a bit of an accepted thing in debates, and you'll see it especially on the BBC because the BBC struggles to defend itself. You'll have someone like Claire Fox you know, blithely declared that, like, you know, the, the it's journalists are full of lefties, and that's, you know, and then it becomes that that's kind of accepted. And I think there's a real problem with that. I think um, there's a kind of, uh, I think there's a, yeah, I think there's a real problem with that. Like, I wouldn't be surprised. I saw Tim Dale, uh, Ian Dale, the kind of Tory-minded LBC presenter, say that he didn't think that Paul Dacre and or Charles Moore would get those jobs. That's very possible. It could actually be just a culture war thing, but then I wouldn't be surprised if instead of that they just appoint people who are equally, or, or maybe not quite as as as, uh, as obnoxious. But and that becomes as, that seems the compromise, and that seems to be the way this government works uh, in a lot of things. So I, I I think I think there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about the independence of these organisations. And and actually, what was really quint it seemed really coincidental as well that these names were uh, kind of mooted the day after Andrew Neils announced this new television channel, this new GB News channel, which I think the quote from the press release said something like, we won't always assume that the government is wrong, which seems like a very odd uh, position for journalists to be in. I mean, I, uh, you know, just on, on your last point about, you know, maybe it's someone who's slightly less horrendous or maybe less well known as horrendous than uh, Dacre and, and Moore. I mean, if you go back through all the Conservative budgets over the last 10 years, you will find that they do that every year, whether it's the silver tax or the pasty tax or whatever it is, or cutting the police. There's always something that is leaked and trailed in advance of the budget. It is so horrendous. Everyone is up in, up in arms or up in their arms, as my German husband says. And then it's something not quite so bad and therefore everyone goes, oh, well, that's good. That awful thing didn't happen. So, you know, I wouldn't put that past them. But from the point of view of independence of the BBC, unfortunately, the BBC already lost their independence. And this happened in relation to the Gulf War. I mean, this happened with regards Andrew Gilligan and the dodgy dossier. You know, suddenly the whole structure of governance for the BBC was changed and you have a, gover a, a government appointee who is the chair and you have a board and now we see in Davies who is a former conservative candidate 
you know, saying things like, um, you know, well, we, you know, we, we're getting rid of all this left wing anti government humor, you know, like, um, have I got news for you? I mean, it is really terrifying. Now, in, in Scotland, you know, let's just say the BBC doesn't always kind of seen as all that impartial up here, particularly if you're uh, pro independence as uh, pro independent as I am. But some of that was actually that it was not local BBC journalists who were allowed to cover the biggest story in their careers, but people who were parachuted in like Sarah Smith and uh, Jim Nochte and so on. So, so literally London took over BBC Scotland at Pacific Quay and ran the BBC around the time of the referendum. And if you were to go back, although it was a binary question, yes, no, to independence, we would have a liberal representative, a Labour representative, a Conservative representative, and an SNP representative. So it would be three to one, even though it was a kind of binary question. So, you know, what do you mean by impartiality? How you do it? Even if you were to look at, uh, there was a Professor John Robertson analysed a year's worth of output, looking at how often politicians were interrupted how often an adjective was added that was derogatory. So it doesn't need to be full on Andrew Neil British Fox. You know, it used to be a newsreader would pass no comment whatsoever. And I remember watching Dan Rather when I went to America and was shocked at how much he was giving his opinion. Whereas now we get opinion and we get opinion within the news. So actually, we're being fed that all the time by the BBC. And Andrew Gilligan was right. It was a dodgy dossier and that was used and that was not the Conservatives. That was used to take away the independence way back then. It's just going to get worse, but it isn't independent. It, it can't be because of the governance structure. Thank you both for that. Um, we have a question. It's a short one, but possibly a longer answer from Angela Hegarty. Who do you think will leave the UK first, Scotland or Northern Ireland? Philippa, do you want to take that first? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I'd be quite happy for either. I mean, uh, it, I mean, it's hard to say. You know, they're kind of both on a on a race. Um, the Scottish government put forward a report. Uh, at Christmas 2016. So they were the first government to put pen to paper to try and come up with a compromise after Brexit. And it's called Scotland's Place in Europe. They, they did it again in 2017 with a bit more flesh on the bone. And it was asking that both Scotland and Northern Ireland, how we voted, which was Remain. And if you've seen the map, you know every single area in Scotland voted Remain. Uh, most of Northern Ireland did, though not all that the, the two, those two nations and how they voted should have been respected, that they should have looked for a deal allowing Scotland and Northern Ireland to stay in the single market, maybe in the customs union, depending on you know, how easily that could be done. David Davis threw it out in a matter of six weeks. It was when it was presented, the, the second one in 2017, they didn't even read it. I mean, it was given no respect whatsoever. So Scotland was looking for something similar to what Northern Ireland is meant to be getting now, but obviously we see it being unpicked. Now, all the bluster about the EU um, blockading Northern Ireland, of course we know that's absolute poppycock. But if you look in the internal market bill, the two bits of the withdrawal agreement it sets aside is basically about state aid in Northern Ireland and setting aside the paperwork on goods that go from Northern Ireland to Great Britain, not the other way around. So it, it damages one half of the withdrawal agreement. But this government have made so much propaganda about this blockading, I worry that they're going to come along and feel they need to add another amendment to the bill that will actually undermine the agreement on goods from GB to NI, which is the absolute core of the withdrawal agreement. And so this is what makes me worry that they want a no deal. I mean, this is so blatantly destructive. And, you know, in Northern Ireland, even among the unionist community, a poll showed a couple of years ago, 
56% would have been quite happy for the Czechs to be at the ports because then it wouldn't interfere with their daily lives the way a border would be. And to me, I think this government are stirring up a no deal. I think they are quite happy for there to be a border across Ireland, so long as the EU gets the blame for it. And that will push Northern Ireland absolutely towards a united Ireland. Now, it'll take time, and I don't know about the, the time scale for either. But one of the things is next year, next autumn, it is seven years since our referendum. They talk all this complete rubbish about once in a generation that was never in the Edinburgh Agreement. The only time scale on a referendum is in the Good Friday Agreement. The people of Northern Ireland are allowed a referendum every seven years on a border poll. And therefore that is a time period that we have been through. And obviously I would like to see a, a referendum next autumn because what is being done to, sh to hollow out our parliament is literally going to drive a lot more people towards independence here. The middle way was devolution. The compromise was devolution. This government are taking it away. I mean, either they want rid of us, and we know that surveys suggest that a lot of conservatives in England would be quite happy to see Scotland gone if it makes Brexit easier, or they're just stupid. And it's always kind of hard to know with this government which it is. But I, I think it'll be neck and neck. I think it's kind of hard to call time-wise, but my husband's German. And we were in Germany just a couple of months before the wall came down. And I can tell you, you couldn't see that it was coming down. And then it just came down overnight. So, you know, big radical change, it kind of simmers, it begins to boil, people ignore it or they stir it. And then all of a sudden there's change. So I, I think the United Kingdom is going to change over this next five to 10 years beyond all recognition. Philippa, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, no, I think Philip has probably Philip has probably summed it up quite nicely there. Okay, so no, no, no odds that the bookies have got on it at the moment that you want to share. <laughs> Not at the moment, but I'll let you know if that, that changes. In, in which case, I pass over to Lizzie now to ask the next question. Thanks, Susan. Um, this is probably a question more directed at Philippa again, but I'm sure you might both have a view. Um, it's a question from Colin Gordon. In the last week, it's been alleged by some journalists at Byline Times that there is a kind of alternative facts operation underway relating to COVID-19, involving some high profile actors within the UK clinical research community. These are people who either think that herd immunity is a viable disease management strategy or question the value of social distancing. Two of the people whose roles have been questioned happen to be here in Oxford, Professor Sunetra Gupta and Professor Carl Hennigan. Is this a legitimate scientific debate or is there something more troubling going on? Well, I mean, I obviously know of, uh, of Carl, but I don't know him. So I, I, I don't know what their uh, background is. I don't know what they would have to, uh, to gain by that. So I don't know what their, their connections and so are, are. It's kind of disappointing seeing people either using their own position or perhaps being used, and that's what's hard for me to tell, to, to try to create this kind of uh, narrative and to create this kind of confusion. But we see it happening all over the place. I mean, we have people going, oh, why are we not just following Sweden? The, the narrative that Sweden's having a great time through COVID is just simply a lie. You know, businesses there are crashing because it isn't a formal lockdown and they're getting no support, but people are not in their businesses. They're not in their shops. They're not in their cafes. People in Sweden are incredibly wealthy in comparison to us. They live in much more spaced out housing. So, you know, the idea that you could compare, you know, any inner city Bradford or Glasgow or, you know, poorer parts of London with Sweden and think that's a policy is naive. And already the serology uh, testing, which is looking for antibodies, looking for evidence of immunity, you're still talking seven, eight percent. And, and that's after seven months. So the idea that we're all going to become herd immune. Coronaviruses are notorious for you not maintaining immunity long term. Now, that may well be a challenge even with a vaccine, 
but it's definitely a challenge with people who have milder infection. And I mean, I'm chair of the, of the vaccine all party group. So, I mean, I spend a lot of my time talking about herd immunity and um, kind of uh, humoral immunity around antibodies. So the herd immunity narrative is just nonsense. It's absolute nonsense and it's dangerous nonsense. That is what the government were thinking about until Imperial College showed them that the modeling would mean half a million deaths before you would get to any degree of herd immunity. And the problem with coronaviruses is they tend to change and the immunity you tend to have tends to not last. So with both of those things, you could go through that. You could allow half a million elderly people to die. And at the end of 2021, we would be facing a third wave of COVID that was slightly different and all of our immunity would be gone. So, you know, I don't know these specific people why they're doing that, but, you know, I mean, it's like the anti-vax stuff um, within the media, in, within social media, that anti-state actors are always happy to, to push any of this kind of thing, fund it, stir it up. I mean, Carl Sikora is another one. I mean, he's a, you know, respected cancer uh, specialist. I mean, I've known uh, him and his work uh, most of my career, and he's always been attacking if you like orthodox medical practice in cancer, but he practices privately. So he hates the NHS, doesn't support it, undermines it, etc. So I don't know their background, so I don't know the why, but we are seeing this undermining. And when you were talking about the BBC earlier, one of the things that's happened to us this, this last fortnight in Scotland was the BBC suddenly announcing that they were no longer going to cover the COVID briefings that our first minister does with our chief medical officer uh, and various scientists or uh, the lead clinician of, of our NHS. And there was such an outcry. I mean, they got 50,000 letters complaining about it. So they've decided they'll still cover them, but they're going to have on BBC One a panel of politicians and commentators to tear them apart afterwards. What kind of confusion is that going to cause? So, I mean, there's, there, you know, there's clearly that the UK government switched from the stay at home, public safety, to for goodness sake, get back into your offices and buy Pret-a-Manger sandwiches because we need to get the economy going. And I don't know whether some of this is connected to that, that we go back to the narrative of herd immunity. Oh, it's only old people. Let's lock old people in their houses and the rest of us can get back to normal. But there's definitely somebody there who is thinking about how they make money, who is pushing this kind of narrative and getting people to avoid the whole social distancing, don't get drunk in the pub, et cetera. And that's, they want people to think, you can just go back out and you can just go back out as you were in January. We can go back out, but we can't do it the same way as we were doing it at Christmas. Thank you. Peter, do you want to add anything? No, I'm, I must confess, I'm not, I have seen that story look quite interesting and it did look like a similar influence machine at play to the kind of stuff I, I write about. In terms of the, the, the science of it, I would definitely leave that to Philippa. Thank you. I, I've okay. been kind of chief, chief uh, COVID correspondent for lots of British media for the last seven months. I will get her on, she doesn't cost anything. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for that. I'll just move on to another area, and there've been this is a, a common theme among the questions both sent in and on the chat, which is um, the response of Labour and now, dare I say, it, the Liberal Democrats, um, which has been um, fairly low key. Um, and some questioners have raised the question of, of whether the SNP is really the only party that's consistently pro-European. So the questions came from Mark Wiseman, Andy Pye, and Annette Shaw. And so I'd just like to get the views of both uh, of you on the whole role of opposition and is it, uh, is it sufficient? So Philip, Philip, I want to start. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, you know, Labour must have piles. They've been sitting on the fence for four years. And, you know, when Jeremy Corbyn was leader, it was Keir Starmer who was pushing 
the Labour Party to accept the idea of a second EU referendum or whatever. But now that Keir is leader, I mean, it has been startling how utterly silent he's been in PMQs on anything to do with Brexit. And so it's back to the same sort of triangulation, what, what Labour kind of made their own back in the in the 1990s, which is, you know, your opposition's policy, but a wee bit softer so that you don't get shut out. And obviously now that they've lost the red wall, where of course there was a lot of Brexit support in the north of England, you know, they, they're kind of don't really know what to do. And so often it's incredibly inconsistent what they will support, what they won't support, when they abstain, when they vote against. I mean, even not to do with Brexit, but the thing about the the um, overseas operations on Wednesday, I mean, the UK is already in the process of breaking an international treaty, and they decide in the middle of that week to pass a law that says that UK soldiers cannot be held responsible to international law when they're on operations overseas. I mean, it's like the UK setting out to be a rogue state, and Labour abstained on that. It is just unbelievable to abstain on something uh, of, of that magnitude. So, I mean, I don't know whether Keir Starmer will, will find his feet again, but at the moment they seem to be more, let's not upset anybody, so let's kind of not really have any strong policies. And I'm really disappointed. Obviously, it's been your conference this weekend. Um, you know, obviously your leader deciding that... Um, the Lib Democrats no longer stand for, you know, pushing to rejoin Europe, stay in Europe or, or you know, simply being European supporters. I think that's very disappointing. Obviously, for us, knowing that Ed campaigned around a second Brexit referendum, his absolute stubbornness around the idea that the people in Scotland should have their will uh, recognize. I don't expect any of the parties to support independence. I don't have an issue of that. But to say that the people of Scotland actually have no right to even vote on it is very anti-democratic for, for Lib Dems. But to see them as the last party who whose entire um, raison d'etre and definition for the last four years has been their stance as totally pro-European, totally anti-Brexit, I was quite startled at that this weekend, and you know, you you'll have more of an explanation for it than than I do. But unfortunately, for all of you that are living in England, I mean, short of the the Greens, it doesn't leave you, it it doesn't leave you kind of uh, much expression of your political wish to support being in Europe, and and that's always wrong. You always need different viewpoints, and you always need opposition. Yeah, I think I think what's interesting, and Starmer seems to be, from what my reading of it seems to be, there seems to be kind of an obsession with trying to appeal to the, the so-called red wall seats that were lost in a general election. You know, I thought the, the Armed Forces Bill this week was or last week was was, you know, which basically it, which is which will allow which basically means it'll be almost impossible to bring uh, cases against British members of the armed forces for crimes committed more than, overseas more than five years ago. And you need, partly because, and also you need the attorney general to sign off on it, which is Suella Braverman, so good luck with that. Um, and which a lot of, even including senior British generals spoke out against it. And it's, and it's had a lot of condemnation internationally that will undermine international law. And I thought Keir Starmer clearly knows this sort of territory very well, you know, whipping to abstain on the vote and then uh, censoring MPs who uh, who voted who, who voted against the bill, I thought spoke to this kind of attempt to try and triangulate. It felt very like being back twenty years ago with this attempt to triangulate like mad out of a situation, and that doesn't make me feel. I think like it does feel a little bit like Keir Starmer. It's this kind of desire to be seen amongst Brexit supporters or former Tory vote or former Labour voters as you know the kind of patriotic guy who's uh, who's on their side i'm not quite sure if that's going to work anyway in, in terms of getting those voters back i'm not quite sure where it's going to leave him at the end of it all well thank you um one of the comments that's just come in actually uh, philippa you may be pleased to hear or not is that um maybe the scots nats should field candidates in england um mm -hmm. But I can't resist the temptation to come back to on, on the question of the, the Lib Dems because uh, 
several of us who are here. We're, I, I hasten to say we're a non-party political organisation. We actually have members of all parties, I think, I think possibly excepting UKIP, um, uh, supporting us. But um, I think the Lib Dems uh, had a, a very heated debate and came out in the end saying that uh, they have a long-term aspiration, but not necessarily in a short-term goal of uh, uh, continuing or resuming membership of the EU. Um, and certainly many of us joined the party because that's what, uh, that's what was an offer. Um, I, I agree, it's unfortunate Ed didn't say more about Europe in his speech. Um, but um, just another question that's come in from quite a few people, and I just wanted to raise this. Um, and that was, um, I think the people who mentioned it were John, Jonathan Harris, Catherine Butler and Stephen Little. And they're all interested in the question of whether there are parallels um, between what's happening here in the UK and what happened in Germany in the 1930s and whether you would apply the, uh, the word fascism to what is going on, uh, are we at that point? So maybe Peter wants to start on that one. I think you can definitely, you know, when I, I covered the 2016 presidential election in uh, the United States, uh, and I traveled across the United States, and then I ended up, I remember I was reporting from like kind of Fifth Avenue when Donald Trump was elected. Uh, and I ended up spending a kind of an evening, a night with a bunch of what were basically neo-Nazis and also Hasidic Jews for Trump. It's a very, very odd collection of people. And I wrote in my copy, in my first line, that you know, we were watching fascism on the streets of America. And my editor at the time kind of edited it out. And I do feel like in America, there's a very strong you know, sense in which I think we are, or we at least with attempts at fascism or kind of crude attempts at fascism. And I think what you're probably seeing in America is, in, in Britain is an attempt to ape a society, you know, in America, America. So I'm not quite sure if that makes America, Britain on the road towards fascism. I think what you're seeing is, I definitely think Britain and uh, Johnson is trying to ape what Trump does. Um, that which doesn't necessarily correspond to if Trump is trying to ape fascism. I mean, Johnson is, I'm not sure, but I definitely think you're seeing the kind of delegitimization of institutions, the you know, kind of delegitimization of media. You know, I think all of that is very much the Trump playbook. And I, and I think that's what we're totally watching in, in Britain at the moment. Um, Anybody want to comment? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, as I said, my husband's German. So, you know, the, the kind of story of what his family went through in the war, etc., makes a lot of these things very poignant to us. One of the stories, a very simple one that I raised in the house around freedom of movement is um, my mother-in-law was Polish and uh, Hans's father was German and they were not allowed to marry in the war because she was Polish and they had a child that was taken away from them and his father was lifted by the Gestapo and his mother was a forced labourer simply because they wanted to get married and my husband used to say I can't believe that in one generation I can marry who I love and live and work where I like. And now in another generation, we're throwing that away. Um, so, I mean, I think I, I th to me, I've always thought freedom of movement was the biggest single benefit that any of us got as individuals. Um, our ability to you know, live, work, love, study all over Europe. I think, as Peter talked about there, if you use the word fascism, actually people take such a strong reaction to that, it often undermines what you're, what you're talking about, what your article is. So I would never use the word because then everyone just throws their hands up. But if you look at the way, the slow creeping way you know, Hitler was elected in 1933. He didn't storm the barricades at that point. You know, it was the, the wealthy, the aristocracy, you know, people went along with it. And then right down to where ordinary people were shutting their eyes. So yeah, I, I, think, the, I think the UK is in a, going in a very dangerous direction. Um, but I think when, whether in an article or a speech, you use the word fascism, then that belongs so utterly to the Nazis that people go, ah, you're overreacting and, and you, you lose the argument. They don't even read what you've written. So I think it's talking about how people are being manipulated, the manipulation that's happening behind the scenes and the loss of voice, the loss of democracy and debate in the way the House of Commons is being used. The fact we were prorogued, the fact that they want to change the balance between executive and parliament, the
the fact that they want to get rid of judicial review, that even the fact you've got Suella Braverman as the attorney general with her background. You know, I, I think these are things that need to be discussed and debated. I think you can even talk about the parallel to 30s Germany. I just would never use the word fascism because people just glaze over and stop listening to what it is you're actually talking about. Thank you very much, Philippa. I'll hand back to our chair, Jill. Uh, th thank you very much, Philippa. That was a very poignant story to finish on, um, obviously from the heart. Um, both excellent answers to some rather difficult questions. Thank you very much for the time that you've given us this evening. And you know, all at Oxford for Europe are really pleased that you could give us all this time tonight. Um, you've both given us a very valuable insight into how our democracy is under threat as never before. Uh, there's also relief that both in Parliament and journalism, our backs are being covered by the likes of people like you. So again, great many thanks. Um, thank you also to everyone who joined the meeting tonight. We had nearly 90 people at one point on the call, so very pleasing. Um, Oxford Europe, we're already planning our next event. Um, we don't ever stop, we keep on going. And obviously, Philippa, you acknowledge that this is the thing that we need to do, so we are. So I would recommend that people keep an eye on our Facebook page and see what events are happening. And we'll just carry on as well as we can. Um, we're also very active, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So follow us there whenever you can. And thank you very much, everyone, for taking part. And good night. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for a very informative talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Very good. Thank you. Bye. Be safe. Thank you. 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 Thank you, David. Great event. Let's get together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Bye. Bye. Bye.